Hi everyone, this is Andrew Hoffman. Welcome back. For those of you that aren't aware, I'm a software engineer, a security researcher, and a technical author based out of the Pacific Northwest. Today, I wanted to do a quick tutorial on some of the secret functionality behind JavaScript variables and scope. This is functionality that you probably won't even be able to find on tutorials in the web. Some of this you're going to have to dig into the official spec or, of course, watch the rest of this video in order to grasp and understand. So let's get started. Most of you are familiar with JavaScript because if you're on my channel, you have interest in programming or cybersecurity. And even if you're interested in cybersecurity, every single web application runs a JavaScript front end, so you need to know some JavaScript. So let's start at the top. So if you want to declare a variable in JavaScript, there's a couple ways that you can do it. Now, here we have var age. This is kind of the classic way of creating a variable in JavaScript. We're telling the interpreter to allocate some memory and a pointer, etc. Now, this is a function scoped variable definition, and we'll get into that soon. In newer versions of JavaScript, you can also block scope a variable definition. So if you use the let keyword, it's scoped to the nearest block. If you use the var keyword, it's scoped to the nearest function. Now, the const keyword in ES6 and forwards is block scoped just like let. However, it cannot be reassigned. Now here, there's actually a fourth way of declaring a variable that most people don't fully understand. And that's called a global definition. And it has some global slash unique scope. And I'll explain that right away, because I think a lot of people are going to be like, what's the difference between, you know, a global definition and other types of variable definitions. So right off the bat, we can console.log age four, and we'll get the result of 55 back. Okay. Now, what's going on when you create a global definition is by default, it's going to look for the nearest function like it would with a var. However, when you do this in a browser environment, it's going to operate in a little bit of a funny manner. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to attach itself to the window object if it's available by default as a property. So we can also reference this by saying console.log window.h4. So you'll notice that h4 is a variable in scope. Window.h4 is actually a property on the window object that is instantiated whenever you open a tab in a browser. So you'll note that we get 55 on both of these. So that's kind of interesting, right? So if you do a global definition, not only are you function scoping that data, but you're also, in the case of the browser, creating a shortcut on window in order to access that. And you really don't want to do this because this can lead to a lot of namespace pollution. So for example, if you're making use of global definitions a lot, let's say you have a thousand different identifiers, then you might actually run into some conflicts with built-in window properties. And obviously that's something that you desperately want to avoid. An example of this is window.location. You could create a globally defined variable called location, and suddenly you're going to have a conflict on window. So let's try to print that. And here we go. It turns out that neither of these ended up binding because the interpreter tried to attach location to window and found that window.location was already defined. And so I'm imagining in this particular scenario it actually just ignored your definition, which would of course lead to bugs in your application. You can see window.location right here is actually the window.location object that ships with the browser. And right here, location is once again referencing the window.location that ships with the browser. So due to namespace conflicts, you want to avoid whenever possible using the global definition because it's going to mess up or simply just not get set due to the status of the properties on the window object. 
Okay, so we covered the global definition, and we know that we should avoid global definitions of data. Well, what about var, let, and const? So the function block scoped and block scoped constant. Let's talk about those a little bit. It can be a little bit confusing how function scoping differs from block scoping. So what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna create a function. We'll say func is equal to a function, and then we're gonna call this function. And inside of this function, what we wanna do is have a block. And inside of this if statement, we're gonna define age using var equal to 25. Finally, we're gonna console.log age. We're gonna console.log it outside of the if statement. And the reason I'm doing this is to demonstrate how scope differs in vars and lets. So right here, we have a function, we call the function, and we're using var, which of course is function scoped. So we would assume that because we're doing it with a var definition, even though it's inside of this if block, this age value here should be correct. We should print 25 instead of undefined, which is the case. Now, let's try changing this to a let. Let's see what happens. Interesting, reference error age is not defined. So as you can see, when we bind this with a var, the var looks at the if and says, oh, this isn't a function, this is just a block. And then it looks up here and says, this is the nearest function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bind to func. When we change it to let, similar things happen. However, once it hits right here, if true, it's gonna say, oh, this is a block. I'm gonna bind to block. There's no need to go to the function up here. Now, if let was defined inside the function, the function also counts as a block, so it would bind to the function. Now, what is a block? A block is just the nearest set of curly braces, right here, curly braces. So remember that, let and const bind to blocks, var binds to functions, and global definitions bind to the nearest function, as well as getting added as properties on the window object. Now finally, what we should probably talk about is how const works. So we discussed a little bit prior that const works just like let, except for it cannot be reassigned. So let's say const data is equal to 25. We'll console.log that data. And we should get the value 25. Wonderful. Now, what if we try to modify the data inside of data? We say data equals data plus five. That should give us a result of 30. However, we can even see an error in this JS bin attempting to override data, which is a constant. If we run this, we're gonna get an error, assignment to constant variable. So this is very useful whenever you have some type of information you definitely don't want changed, but there's some quirks with it. So if we were to say data is equal to an object, and this object has a property called value, and it's equal to 25, now, when we console.log data, we're gonna get this object back. And in fact, if we console.log data.value, the property on the object, we would get 25 back. Now, if we do some arithmetic, we say data equals, or we could even say data.value equals data.value plus five, and we console.log data.value, you'll note that we got 30. So a const doesn't protect you from modifying the contents of an object. It only protects you from changing what this name right here, data, points to. In this case, it's gonna to point to the same object, but the contents of the object can be changed. Now, in the case of primitive values like numbers, it's pointing to a number in memory, and of course, that number can't be changed because the number corresponds with the memory address. But with a more flexible data structure, for example, an array, or in this case, an object, the location of the array or object doesn't change, but what it contains can change. That's it, thanks for watching, and leave any comments or questions you have 
below the video.